right over here and just pick one. One that I can maybe understand a little bit, maybe one that's my favorite, and, and share that one with you. So if you have time, and try to make time, go back and read Proverbs 19, if that's not your habit, to read a proverb for today. There's plenty in here about how we ought to deal with the poor, or who the poor are, uh, the rich, the foolish, liars, deceitful people, um, all kinds of fantastic stuff. I'd like to look at Proverbs uh, 19, verse 11 today. Verse 11 says, The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. So maybe in some cases procrastination isn't such a bad thing. If, if you wait to be angry, maybe after all you don't need to be angry at all. Or perhaps you can have a righteous anger at a later time. So don't jump to conclusions, I think is what we're saying here. Discretion or prudence is looking at a matter carefully and understanding it. And so if somebody has prudence, if somebody has wisdom and is careful in his life, he'll wait, he'll check himself, he'll say, that really makes me upset, but I'm going to hold back. I'm going to defer my anger until later. Maybe once I know all the facts, I'm not going to answer this matter uh, quickly. Um, and it goes on, it says, it is his glory to pass over transgression. Uh, the, the Apostle Paul says, why don't you rather suffer wrong? Um, in Sunday school, we talked about God's love. And uh, that, to me, spoke that if, if we have God's love in us, we're going to show that to others. And um, I really enjoyed that this morning. If you weren't in Sunday school, you missed a, a good lesson. Um, but this man who, who um, looks over transgression, it, it's going to have glory. He's going to you know, have God's glory in his life. And people are going to look at that man. They're going to say, you know, he had every right to be angry. That was wrong what happened to him. He should have been angry. And if, he, if the man were angry, everyone would say, yeah, he had every right to be angry. But if he weren't angry, they would have looked at him in awe and said, wow, there's something special. That's God's glory in your life, that you weren't angry or you looked over this transgression. Proverbs also says, love covereth a multitude of sins. So we need to let God's love come through us, defer our anger, and help us to look over transgression and love a lost world. Our last song is number 473, Heavenly Sunlight, 473. Walking in sunlight all of my journey Over the mountain, through the deep vale Jesus has said, I'll never forsake thee Promise divine that never can fail Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight Flooding my soul with glory divine. Heavenly hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Verse 3. In the bright sunshine, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above. Singing his praises, gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, Flooding my soul with glory divine. Alleluia, I am rejoicing, singing his praises, Jesus is mine. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evils against you falsely for my sake. 
Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I'd like you to go ahead and and turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 17. Uh, We're going to be in Acts chapter 17 this morning. What we're going to learn from Acts chapter 17 from the life of Paul is the same concept that Jesus was expressing there in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's, it's a concept which is difficult for us as people to sometimes grasp, but yet is fundamental to obtaining the right perspective. It is uh, completely foundational to our Christian walks and our, and our Christian lives. Uh, and it is something that uh, for many is just going to be a reminder. Uh, and I hope maybe just through the way I express it, uh, what God's put on my heart and uh, what's really been weighing on me, um, just, just having another expression of the same thing that you know sometimes goes through your heart and your mind will hopefully strengthen um, your walk with the Lord through this. Uh, but let's go ahead and, and read in Acts 17, just the first little paragraph here. And lo and behold, we're only reading a few verses, but it's separated on two different pages of my Bible. I, I love how it works out like that. But Acts chapter 17, and verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where it was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort. Um, that is that is one of my uh, favorite Bible slams right up there with uh, backsliding heifer from Hosea 4. Uh, lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out uh, to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city and crying, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the degrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken the security of Jason and of the other, they let them go. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that as we look into your word this morning uh, and we seek to understand you better, to understand what it is that you have for our lives, uh, God, to, uh, to learn how to uh, live more in the victory that you have won through your son Christ and to just walk with you. I pray that you would just build up our faith, that you would strengthen us this morning. God, I pray that uh, your Holy Spirit would speak through your word, uh, that it would be more your spirit than it is me, and that you would just uh, illumine uh, the the central truths of these. And, and God, I pray that you just make it uh, applicable and real uh, to all the hearts of the people that are here. Uh, God, bless your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What we're going to learn from Acts 17, I can, I can summarize it as one thing. God wants you to turn your world upside down. And, and that's more for yourself, more, more for your own perspective than it is even for those that are around you. Because it's something that when we get it right, it, it changes everything. And it automatically changes our relationships uh, with those that are around us. You see, these people, they said, when, when they brought them forth and they're bringing an accusation, they said, these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. To them, that is a horrible, horrible thing. 
to them that is you know what is the top of the list you know are these you know criminals are these rebels are these people who are lying are they thieves are you know what kind of you know are, are they selling you know wares that are forfeits and you know castaways and just trying to scam the people out of their money like what 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 is the accusation against these people number one they say these are turning the world upside down you ever think about that why did these people say that why is this so important what what does that even mean what are they accusing them of now we have to realize that the society that that paul is ministering in is very similar to the one that we find ourselves in today i mean they had they had different outlets i mean we have technology so we can express our sin and you know our, our culture in certain ways different than they could but the heart of man man is man people are people anywhere you go you know throughout all time and back then just the general way the society worked is very similar to the way today work back then again this is a primarily um roman society but of course rome won during this time period rome won militarily but greece won culturally uh, it's been said that rome you know conquered greece but greece conquered rome at the same time because all of the culture they had was so influenced by that. And so as a whole, the culture that they're ministering in is absolutely seeped and, and totally overwhelmed by this drive and, and push by all these people to have different philosophies. That's why when you get to you know the book of John, John chapter one, he says, you know, the the word, which was, you know, in the beginning. In the beginning was the word, the the logos. That concept, the logos, the word, that was what many people in this society looked for as the Messiah. Not as a person, but heathen Greeks who were looking for some kind of philosophy that would enable them to, you know, unlock the mysteries of the universe and finally get it. Like they're going to understand it now and they'll achieve some kind of, you know, humanistic, you know, utopian, you know, I'm like perfect now because I understand this logos, this mystery. Uh, these were people that were just, you know, whatever the new philosophy was, you know, it got to the point in, in Athens, it mentions elsewhere, you know, the people were, you know, doing nothing else but to hear some new thing because they're just looking for an answer and they're looking for it in philosophy. And so these people are saying the, the whole, our whole system of life, our whole system of how we do things, what we're looking for, our, our drive, wh how, what we're doing, these people have got it totally backwards. They're doing it completely different. Well, I'm here today to tell you that we ought to be doing things completely backwards. Wow, you're backwards, John. Thank you. A great compliment. You see, it's I've heard I've heard a preacher say, and I think I've mentioned it here before, but I've heard a preacher say, you know, like like this is some you know like legitimate exhortation to his people. Well, you can trust God for eternity. Why can't you trust Him for tomorrow? Well, tomorrow's a lot closer. I got a paper and a quiz tomorrow. I I have, I have stuff that's immediately coming up. I am interacting with that. I can touch it. I can taste it. I can feel it. It is right there. It is, it, is, it is something that is close to me. Eternity, I have no idea. It's distant. When, when am I going to die? What's going to happen? I don't know. It's, it's far from me. It, it's something that is, in a sense, not real. Notice the air quote. It's not real to me. Uh, it, it is something that is, is far from us. It's natural for us to be more able to have more capacity to accept things about you know way in the future or you know sometimes you know way in the past than it is for us to change our way of thinking of right now because the way we live naturally is completely overwhelmed by in a sense pride and selfishness in, in us we live for us i live for me that's the default you know, the day when, when I stop praying, if, if I decide I'm, I don't have time, I'm not going to read my Bible today, you know, I'm not going to go find some other believers in the body of Christ to edify and share that fellowship with. If I just say, I'm going to step back from that, am I still walking, you know, the straight and narrow way and, you know, I'm still doing what God wants and, you know, I've my heart and mind through Christ Jesus and all that? Nope. I, I don't just kind of keep going. If you, you, you're off. 
you're who knows where. You know, it's, it's like if you're flying around like an RC plane and you get out of the range of the controller, is it going to do what you tell it to do? No, it's just gone. It's going to do whatever it wants. So we get, we get back into that mode because that's the default. That's like factory settings of you know humanity. You have a phone sometimes and it breaks, you restore it to factory settings and, it, and it's gonna be kind of the same. It's the same way it is with humanity. We're born with a sin nature and that nature is something that is completely me and us focused. It is focused on right now and right here. And here came these people into the city and they're saying, unlike all the other ones, they're not saying, okay, we have this new God, so you can you know, do it your way, but you might enjoy this way. You can do it your way plus, you know, enjoy this other thing. And we have this philosophy where, you know, this will help you, in, you know, embrace the real you. And they'd have these teachers come through. But lo and behold, here comes, here comes Paul, here comes, you know, his, his group of people. And he gets up and he says, you know what? The stuff that you're prioritizing right now, you're thinking about, you know, what you're wearing, what you're going to be eating, what you're working. You shouldn't even think about that. You know, it says in, uh, it says in uh, Matthew 6, uh, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, uh, nor yet for your body what you sh shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment? And so they come, you shouldn't even think about that. What you need to prioritize is what God wants. And they're like, Okay, where, where is he at? Can't I see him you know, in the flesh like I can look at you, Paul? What's he going to tell me? No, 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 no. You, you have to pray and you have to listen to his word and the Holy Spirit's going to guide you and, and you're going to do what you know, God wants you to do and, and live in the spirit. And they're like, what on earth? Who would do that? That's what they're thinking. They're like, they're like hold on, pa Paul, Paul. You've got it backwards. You, you've messed up, man. You were... You know, haven't you listened to you know Aristotle and Plato all, the, all these people? Haven't you? Well, some of them later, some before, but they're like, haven't you heard all these great philosophers and all of these you know great theologians of the day looking at stuff? You know, don't you understand how this works? And they're saying, haven't you heard God? Don't you understand how this works? And the conclusion these people came to is you're doing life backwards. Well, we're going to learn from this from this text two aspects. Uh, of, of that flipping our world upside down, of that what the world sees as making us backwards, but what God sees as finally putting us, you know, head up, level-headed, able to tackle the world as we were created to and designed to before sin um, changed us and, and flipped us the wrong way. Um, so the first aspect that we see here in Acts chapter 17, we see when, when he comes, as as is his his habit, because uh, it is most effective, he goes to the people that have some knowledge of God. He goes to the synagogue. Uh, they, they knew the name of God. They had, you know, all the Sunday school Bible stories. They knew them all. So he could just go right into talking about Christ, and that's what he does. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Now, the Jews, I am lumping them right in, in as we look at this, I'm lumping them right in to the Greeks in the way that they were approaching life and their mindset. And you can say, but, but they had the Old Testament. They weren't some, you know, heathen pagans. They were just, you know, kind of misled, hadn't accepted Jesus yet Jews. But in reality, the way they're approaching life is exactly the same as the rest of the world. They're like, but they have a religion. Unto them, we're giving the oracles of God. And, you know, they have some knowledge of Jehovah. But they're approaching life exactly the same as all of these philosophizing Greeks. You know, well, religion, without Christ, you're approaching it the same. I mean, you, it looks a little different. The scenery is a little different. But the way you're approaching it is exactly the same. Because while the Greeks would be looking for some kind of philosophy, it would still be operating in the ways of man. And the Jews were looking to religion, but they were still operating on the right here, right now. What am I doing? That's why they were so steeped in tradition. It's what man tells me to do. It's what I am doing. You know, that's why the whole, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is telling him, look, you, you're doing it wrong. You're focusing on the outward, but I, but I say unto you, it, it's on the inside. That's what matters. You're like, okay, if the person, you know, isn't committing adultery and they're not robbing anyone, they're not, you know, killing anyone, they're fine. But he's like, if you're looking at a woman to lust after her, if you are, if you are, um, you know, hating your brother, you've already committed that sin. 
to them it's like, what on earth? But I've got it right on the outside. And God says, no, that I look at things differently. God looks at things differently. So he, so he has to tell them here, Christ must needs have suffered. The first point here is that there is profit through suffering. What on earth, John? You know, that, this, is, this is the question that the world today, the, the first book that God ever gave us, the first revelation that God ever ga- gave for us to have was Job. That was the first we got. It came before Genesis. The events of Job happened somewhere around, you know, Genesis 12, somewhere, you know, around the time of, of uh, Abraham. So before all that's done, Job is done. You know, jo- uh, Genesis isn't even written until Moses comes way later. First book we get is Job. And what is the point of Job? The whole point of Job is God is trying to teach humanity. He works a little bit differently than they think he works. That God can accomplish things in ways that they don't expect. And I think it's in a little bit, um, you know, tied to uh, the promises of redemption. But, you see, he has to argue here, Christ must needs have suffered, because the Jews were thinking, he doesn't need to suffer. He's the Messiah who's going to come in on the white horse. He's going to take out Rome. He's going to have this great military conquest. He's going to come in strength like a Gentile king. He's going to out-Gentile the Gentiles. He's going to out-strong men the strong men. He's basically going to take the world's way of doing things and one-up them and do it better than them, and then he's going to own everything, and then we can oppress the Romans, and we can get tribute from them, and we're going to be this great nation. And what are they doing? They're thinking, me. We're going to get stuff. We're going to be in control. We're going to be the leaders. They're looking at life the, the exact same way that that the, the, the Greeks were, that the Romans were. It's a me mentality. And Paul is saying, no, God works a little bit differently. It says, Christ must needs have suffered. You know, the central question of Job, Satan goes to God and he says, basically, believers are only serving you because you bless them. That's what Job said. Believers are only serving you because you bless them. And so God says, okay. Now this is God who's, who's allowing this now in Job's life. God says, okay, you, know, you, you can take his blessings. You can take his stuff. Don't touch Job, but you can take his stuff. And of course, you know, Job is still, hey, the Lord gave, the Lord take away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And so Satan's like, okay, well, you know, he was willing to let his kids die as long as he'd be fine. You know, let me touch him. And God's like, okay, yeah, you can afflict him. Can't kill him, but you can afflict him. So he afflicts him. And, you know, there's this whole, and you look at him, and he's very troubled, you know, going through a very emotionally trying time. And so you go through Job, and you look at what he's saying, and it's like they're expressing truths about God, and at the same time, their human frailty is on full display. And, you know, it's just a fascinating thing to read through. But you get through that whole thing, and you look at that. And basically, what God is demonstrating at the end of it, at the end of it, Job walks out, and he knows God better now. He has a better relationship uh, with God than he had when he started. The stuff, that's an afterthought, but Job grew. Um, he, he knew God more. So we look at that, and people who are trying to, you know, Eliphaz and, and, and Bildad and Zophar, you know, they're saying, basically, God judges wickedness, God rewards righteousness. It's like, this is mechanical, it always happens that way, black and white, that's just how God works. And God is demonstrating that in the life of someone who's righteous, he can use suffering for his glory, and he can use suffering to accomplish good. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, not this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. The one that you were looking for as this military conqueror is one who had to suffer because he would accomplish good through suffering. Now with God, we understand with the principles of, you know, uh, you know, sacrifice, substitution, and atonement, you know, to make a fitting sacrifice for us, Christ had to be that. But even, even in uh, our lives, I, I want you to go ahead and turn to First Peter chapter 4. Uh, this is a passage that helps us understand that, because again, we're, we're trying to kind of deprogram, in a sense, our perspective, uh, because when, when we stop focusing on that, we, we just slip right back into the the me mentality and part of that is we don't accept that there is any profit through suffering um you know we'll we'll deny that this is how god works 
Peter expounds the same concept that Paul was talking about, that Jesus talked about in the Sermon on the Mount, that God talked about back in Job. It's the same concept throughout the scriptures. But Paul, uh, but, uh, Peter here has a really good discussion of it. Uh, he says, For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in the lasciviousness, a lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abomination, abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Now, now this is a verse I have sometimes, you know, have a hard time identifying with. I was saved when I was five. You know, I, I, maybe I had a, you know, like a, um, you know, drinking problem when I was four. You know, I had too much orange juice in the morning. I don't know. Um, but anyway, uh, verse verse five: uh, Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? For this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. Peter here is expressing the same flipping your world upside down reversal, the same God working and profiting through sufferings. Um, later on, Later on in the chapter, he says, But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may uh, be glad also with exceeding joy. And then at the end, wherefore let them suffer according to the will of, uh, according to the will of God, commit the keeping of their souls unto him in well doing as unto the faithful creator. Uh, basically, all these ideas together. Peter is communicating this concept that God is working through and accomplishing things through the suffering of man. We saw it accomplished through Christ and his sacrifice, but we can see even accomplished through man. Uh, because as we go through things, you know, as, you know, as Jesus said, you know, they, they revile you because they reviled me. As we go through these things, God is accomplishing things in our life that there is no other way he could accomplish. And as we go through them and respond to them appropriately, recognizing the will of God and not just, you know, the expectation of man, but acknowledging God in the difficult circumstance, it is totally different to everyone that's around us. Because everyone that's around us, they're the ones that have got it backwards. They're the ones that, you know, they flipped it upside down. You know, we're right side up, and they, and they think they think we're backwards. But whatever the case, we are reverse from them. And so they look at us, and it's like someone has cancer, someone dies. You know, the, the horrible things that happen where you know even children could die, or, or someone could be there could be like a miscarriage, or someone could be stillborn. You think what a horrible thing. Uh, you know, that's just difficult. You know, to go through. But yet from that, God will accomplish great work, and people will know the character of God more people will be saved and learn about him and, and get saved for the first time and, and, and recognize who he is. Because sometimes it's through that suffering. It, it's, it's through God's vehicle that, that he uses there to accomplish his will that some of the greatest things are accomplished. Why does God do that? Why does it have to be that something happens and someone suffers and now someone, finally, when something bad happens, they'll consider something eternal. They'll think about God and they'll open their heart and maybe you know, they'll accept him or understand something. Why does that have to happen? And God not just like beam down and like confront someone and be like, you sinner, you know, you need to get saved. You're thinking, you know, why couldn't it be in might? Why does it have to be in weakness? Why doesn't God work through strength? Why is it in his weakness that my grace is sufficient for you? I don't know, but that's how God works. There's profit, profit, the thing that's left over. There's profit in suffering. God works through that. He accomplishing, accomplishes things through that. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered. You know, there's a whole concept, you know, it's called the theology of suffering. It's just a way that God works. I don't know if I can fully explain that to you. Well, I know that I can't fully explain that to you. But I know that it is how God works. And I know that no matter what happens, it's not that we're not supposed to feel any kind of negative emotions our emotions are always secondary. It's something we feel, but it's never something we make primary in the scriptures. So there's always sadness, there's always mourning, but it's a different kind. Because as Christians, as believers, we can recognize that a sovereign God is accomplishing something in our lives and the lives of those people around us. That the things that we want to hold on to, 
to, to the world, to someone who does not know God, they're holding on to their car, their house, their job, their money, their wealth, their entertainment. And you go and try to, you know, you go somewhere, pro- you know, in, in um, America that's prosperous, a good neighborhood. And they're not, you knock on their door and try to tell them about God. They're not going to listen to you because they don't need God. I have stuff, so I don't need God. And when you take away their stuff, you take away their life because they've made that everything. But as a believer, when God allows your stuff, your health, your job, your money, your well-being, when God allows that to be taken away, God's not just looking down and saying, okay, I, I, just, you know, I just hate this person today. Random, arbitrary, boom, thunderbolt. I'm judging this person. It's because God's taken that away so he can give us something else. And as believers, we can recognize, you know, we are getting something that is spiritual and immaterial and, and of incomparable worth and value to whatever we lost because what we are getting is eternal. What we are getting is part of a, an understanding of the character of God. You know, if someone gets saved, that person is going to be there forever. A million years down the road, are you going to care that you had a broken leg or that you had some kind of sickness that put you in the hospital so you could witness to someone? No. You know what? That was great. Praise the Lord for that. Because now I'm walking the streets of glory with someone who knows him because of that trial God brought into my life. There's profit through suffering. But then we see in their, in their accusation here, they said, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also, uh, whom Jason hath received. And these all do contrary to the degree, decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. Talking about authority here. Uh, so there's profit through suffering, but we need to, so not only do we need to seek the profit through suffering, but we need to prioritize that which is spiritual. We need to prioritize that which is spiritual. This is part of the whole process of us turning our world upside down, flipping it back right side up, you know, riding the boat, you know, getting back in, in the right frame of mind. You know, it's, it's funny, there are some animals that if you flip them upside down, you know, they could be this vicious, ferocious animal, and they're completely powerless if you flip them upside down. Like, they'll just, like, you know, pass out practically. Uh, yeah, I find that funny. And uh, it feels like sometimes, you know, in, in our minds, mentally, people do the same thing. Um, but this is how we get uh, flipped back the right way. Uh, we need to prioritize that which is spiritual. It says here that, they're saying that there's another king, one Jesus. See, this is having to do with, with their priorities, having to do with the thing. And we talked about this a little bit before. That which is immediate, it's so easy for us to latch on to and hold on to. Because we can see it. We can touch it. We can hold on to it. It's something that's close to us. Um, but Paul and his you know, whole evangelistic team here, as they're here teaching and trying to demonstrate and, and, and show the character of God and explain what the scriptures were saying there, they're working to convince these people that, look, you know, you like obey them that are in authority, I yeah, do all that stuff. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar, but render unto God that which is God, that which is God's. Um, to reach the point in their lives where when it comes down to it, it's like, what choice are you going to make? You know, when you get up, what is the first thing you think about? That it should be God. That God should be the driving force in your life. That the decisions you make should be made with, like, the blinders and presuppositions, you know, of the Bible, which, in effect, aren't because they let you see what, you know, the truth is. It's not that they're, blo- you're, they're blocking you out uh, to what reality is, but they're demonstrating what it is uh, and giving you perspective on that. You know, it's it's funny. I um, I ran into I ran into this one Bible that was it was made by people who believed in covenant theology, and they were going through they were going through the prophets, and so of course they think any time in the Old Testament when it mentions Israel, it's mentioning uh, it's mentioning the church, which is you know wrong. But you go through the prophets, and they'll have sections blessings on the church blessings on the church blessings on the church and then it says judgments on israel it's like what we're like flip-flopping now you know only claiming one um and and not the other don't know why i thought of that just there but um 
where they're, where they're getting at, um, they're saying, you know, they, fl- they flip the world upside down. They're proclaiming another king. Yeah, everything that people go after, there's a great discussion of this in Ecclesiastes because Solomon had the opportunity to get anything that mankind could possibly want. Everything that we could go after. And I'm so glad we have, you know, a book like Ecclesiastes. He basically says, Solomon basically says, look, there's nothing wrong with having stuff. There's nothing wrong with enjoying life and, and taking pleasure in all of the good things that God has given to us. But when we fail to take God into account, and, and this is where these people that Paul is speaking to are at, they are not taking God into account. It's all about them. Life is about stuff. Life is about what they have, what they own, what they can do, their talents, their fame. Like, that's it. That is the sum total of life. In a, and, if, and if we have hope in this world only, we are all men, most miserable. That's why people are miserable out there, because they don't have hope that goes beyond it. So Solomon says that it's fine to enjoy life now. But if we make our life completely about the things that are right now, about the things that we own, about the understanding that we think we have, uh, you know, about the, the fame, the wealth, Uh, you know, the power, the authority that we have. Ultimately, it's it's empty. It's, It's chasing the wind. Vexation of spirit basically means chasing the wind. We're going after something that we feel, literally, we're holding on to it, but it's not real. And I'm not trying to get metaphysical here, but when we live our lives that way, we're missing out on everything that God is doing. See, they're proclaiming another king. That's where I mentioned before some of the verses that said, you know, these people do this. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. How does the kingdom of heaven work? You know, we're not, you know, there are other, you know, all millennialism, post-millennialism stuff. We don't have some kind of view that, you know, it is the kingdom of heaven is something that God's going to like, bam, it's just going to like drop on earth and, you know, he's going to return and set the kingdom. Eventually he will do that. He will have a millennium where he reigns, but that's separate. The kingdom of heaven right now is, is God exercising his sovereign authority on earth, but not through a physical throne. Well, I have some people say, well, then he's not really king, so you can't believe that. What on earth are you saying, John? No, God is still just as much in control, and he's accomplishing whatever he wants to accomplish. But again, it's like the first point, you know, there's profit through suffering. God is allowing things to go through the, the world as they are right now. He's bringing things, working them to an expected end. Why is he allowing some of this stuff to happen right now? That's him and not me, but God is accomplishing his work through it. You know, he is using the wrath of man shall praise him. He's using all that stuff for his glory. Uh, And I don't understand it, but I know God understands it, and I know God's doing it, so I have faith in that. So when it comes down now to what I'm going to prioritize, what king do I obey? What master is on the throne in my life? When it comes time to make a decision, what's the thing I think about? What, what, what's my guide? What is, what is my priority? What is my drive? What is the thing that I get up for every morning? Is it me? Is it stuff? Do I get up to appease the, the Caesar of society by, you know, looking like they look, getting the, you know, education and degrees that they think I should have and you know, having the status that they think I should have and having the abilities and having the stuff? Or do I get up because I have a God in heaven who has a purpose for me right now and through his word and the Holy Spirit communicates to me what I need to do, how I need to live my life, the decisions I need to make from where I should go to college, where I should you know, go and do ministry to you know, who I should talk to when I go to Walmart to you know, whether or not I should make you know, these little decisions. See, they're saying that you know, where they're at, that it's, it's so backwards to these people because, you know, Paul is saying that there's this immaterial God that gives me direction for my life. It doesn't make sense sometimes, but we need to prioritize the spiritual because to them it's not going to make sense, but to us we've experienced salvation. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have the, the guidance from the God of the universe we need to make the choice now that we're going to live in that, that we're going to walk in that. You know, there's imagery that 
uh, that's that Paul brings in not here because this is you know Acts you know Luke wrote this giving some of the more narrative sections uh, but when when Paul writes kind of expressing that concept that if you have another king it's time to you know serve the new king the new master he uses the the you know the phrase of you know dying to yourself of death Because what we consider life, in a sense, and, and you know, follow the metaphor here, what we consider life, our, our classical understanding of that, is, is something that's been uh, conditioned and informed because of our society. To us, life is, you know, the, you know, the house, the white picket fence, and the 2.5 kids, or however many it is, and, and having a car, and a job, and having stuff, and I have a retirement plan, and I have all this stuff worked out. I have friends and I go and do that's life we're preparing our kids for life well God is telling us why are we trying to live when we should be trying to die why are we trying to do everything that we want to do when it's time that we come to the point where we say everything that I want everything that I'm going after everything the world says that I need everything that people expect me to value and give worth and seek after I'm going to set that all aside. I'm going to let that die. And I'm going to accept what the immaterial, spiritual, creator God of the universe has for my life right now. Whatever that will be. That choice, to someone who doesn't know God, is pointless. It, it's, it's foolishness. Yes. Yes, it is. It's backwards. Yeah, it is backwards. It's upside down, yeah, because it's different than them. It's reverse of the philosophy and the mindset of men. This was the message of Paul. Christ must needs of suffer, that God is working through suffering, accomplishing that not only you know, through him, through the, the atoning death of Christ, uh, but through even the lives of mankind, that God works a different way than we think he's going to work. Uh, but also that we need to prioritize the things that are spiritual. They that worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. For, you know, God is spirit. It's that we need to live life differently. You know, this is one of those you know, big picture kind of messages. You know, how that looks is, is going to be different. Because what it comes down to is our perspective, our mindset, our, our philosophy on life. It comes down to when you pillar your head at night. What are you thinking about? Are you thinking about what other people have for you, what society expects, stuff you have? Or are you thinking about what God's done for you, what God is accomplishing through your life, and what God is telling you to do? There's an di entirely different mode that Christians go through life with. That's why when Paul says, I've, I've learned both to abound and I've learned to be abased, and to abound to be hungry, to experience both. Because Paul is saying, look, whether good comes into my life, praise the Lord, he's brought it. Whether loss comes into my life, praise the Lord, he's brought it. Because through anything, God is doing something in my life. And I can be totally content that I am living in obedience and submission to my God, to my Father, to my Savior. You see, when we turn our world upside down, it changes everything. And other people can notice. And so we can serve our king, and we can bring other people to a knowledge of him. And we can help other people see that he works a little bit differently. Turn your world upside down. Heavenly Father, God, we... We thank you so much for your word. We thank you for uh, recording the, uh, you know, the stories that are here, recording uh, you know, these real events of the life of Paul uh, as he sought to just accomplish your will. Uh, and God, we thank you also for just all, all the promises, all the other places in Scripture that you know, give us so much knowledge about these concepts. God, there are some things that we don't understand, and, and God, certainly when you do decide to make that transaction of taking something material from us to give us something spiritual. God, it's so hard to accept. It's so easy for us to get bitter. Uh, but God, I pray that we would see you for who you are, recognize that you work differently. Uh, God, I pray that you would help us just to 
um, keep our perspective on that, to keep our focus on you, uh, that we would live life uh, the way that you want us to live, uh, that we would uh, just submit ourselves to, uh, to your leadership in our lives. And God, we know you have a plan for all of that. We know you're going to accomplish and are working to do great things. God, we thank you that we don't have to live like people who don't know you, but through everything, good, bad, everything in the middle, we can walk with you and do your will. God, thank you so much for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are dismissed.